In this lecture, I want to take some time to go through uh, and describe some of the considerations in the process of transcription. So transcription, uh, you remember, is the process whereby RNA is made from DNA using the enzyme RNA polymerase. This figure shows what's called the central dogma of molecular biology. That is, that DNA is the genetic material, and it is used as a template for making RNA. RNA is the messenger that basically carries the information from DNA to the ribosomes, where it is translated into proteins in the process of translation. Now, RNA is only made from one strand of DNA at a time. And so if we look at this DNA duplex that we see here, the strand of RNA in this case was made um, by copying the bottom strand of the DNA molecule. That means that each of the two strands of the DNA duplex are different because they're complementary to each other, of course, and they have different names. So the strand that's on the top is known as the coding strand because it's complementary to the bottom strand, which is the template strand. It's the template strand that the RNA polymerase uses to make the RNA. And when it makes the RNA, you can see that the sequence is identical to the coding strand of DNA except for the fact that U replaces T. That's why we call the top strand the coding strand and the bottom strand the template strand. Now, um, cells don't copy all of, RNA, all of a DNA to make an RNA. That is, they don't start at one end of a chromosome and go all the way to the end and make one contiguous uh, RNA. Instead, cells are economical in which portions of the DNA molecule they choose to make RNA from. Well, since the RNA is used to make protein and the information for making that protein is contained in DNA in the form of genes, it is important then that the cell have sort of road signs along the way to say, here's where the genes are and here's where to copy um, the RNA from the DNA. Well, it turns out that cells uh, have that. They have uh, sequences within their DNA called promoters. And so promoters are uh, special sequences that are located near the starting point of genes, and we can see some of that occurring on the, on the structure that you see here, that tell the RNA polymerase where to start making RNA. So remember that it's RNA polymerase that copies the DNA. Well, what you see on the screen are a set of different genes, and the genes uh, all start over here on the right. In our numbering designation, we start the numbering for a gene at uh, what's known as base number one, okay? So base number one is the very first uh, base in the sequence of a gene. And if we use that designation within the DNA, we find something interesting when we line up the DNA sequences of a variety of genes, and these genes are all from uh, prokaryotic cells, specifically from E. coli. So you can see the names of the genes over here. If we line up all of the plus one sequences at the same place, we see that ahead of that plus one sequence over, over here, at a region around minus 10, that is about 10 nucleotides, five prime to the start site of the uh, gene sequence, we see a common sequence that appears um, over and over. We note that that common sequence is not identical, but it's very rich, in this case, in what, what are called AT sequences, that is uh, A's or T's, and of course the complement on the other strand would be an A or a T as well. That uh, lining up of the sequences gives something that we call a consensus sequence. So a consensus sequence is uh, taking um, stock of all of the different genes that are known for a particular species, and then looking and seeing what are the most common occurrences of individual nucleotides at specific places relevant to that gene. Well, the minus 10 that I've already talked about is uh, shown up here, and you can see in the minus 10 sequence, as I noted, that the consensus sequence corresponds to the most common occurrence of nucleotides at each of those positions. And we can see that indeed this sequence is in fact AT rich. T A T A A T uh, is there. And beneath each of those nucleotide letters you can see a number. That number corresponds to the percentage of the time 
that that given T, for example, is found um, at that particular position. Below it, you can see um, a, another consensus sequence known as a minus 35 sequence. And you see it's not rich in ATs, but it does have some consensus uh, within there. Consensus meaning that on average, it's more common to find some of these nucleotides uh, than other ones there. Well, what does a consensus sequence mean and why is it relevant for uh, transcription? Well, <coughs> uh, as I noted, a, um, these sequences are sort of road signs. They're not identical road signs because not all, for example, road signs found on a highway are identical either. Towns have their own uh, names that are there, different speed limits and so forth that are there. We can imagine different road signs. Well, when we look at the consensus sequence, we see that very commonly at the minus 10 position that we see an AT-rich sequence. And while there are variations in that, this is a road sign that says there's a gene nearby that may be necessary for transcription. Well, why do they vary? Why aren't they all the same? And that's actually an interesting question. It turns out that the reason that these sequences aren't all the same is that they function in different ways. So let's talk first of all about what the function is and then um, about how and why they vary from each other. The function of these consensus sequences in what we call the promoter. So the promoter is this region of conserved sequence. And by the way, people ask what's the difference between a conserved sequence and a consensus sequence. I use the terms interchangeably. So this consensus sequence is conserved at this location, meaning that it's very commonly found, or some variant of it is very commonly found at this location next to a gene. Similarly, down here, this consensus sequence at the minus 35 is also conserved, commonly found at the minus 35 position uh, from a gene. So what is the function then of these conserved sequences? It turns out that the function of these is to be recognized by the transcriptional, what we call machinery. Now we say machinery because in some cases there are multiple proteins that may be involved in helping transcription to occur. RNA polymerase is one of those proteins. In the case of prokaryotes, it's fairly simple. We might have only RNA polymerase or we might have RNA polymerase and a couple of other proteins that might be involved in helping transcription to occur. So that machinery or that machine is very simple. In the case of eukaryotic cells, the machinery can be very complex. Many proteins binding to these sequences and saying this is the place to start transcription. So I'll say just a little bit about that later. So the function of the conserved sequences, the consensus sequences that you can see on the screen, are to provide a place for transcriptional machinery to bind and begin the process of transcription. Now this depicts, for example, in the case of E. coli, how an RNA polymerase, in simple terms, might bind to a minus 10 and a minus 35 sequence along the bottom. We can see that there are binding sites that tell the RNA polymerase, here's where to bind, and then up ahead of that, uh, at, at position one, that's actually where the first base of the messenger RNA that's going to be made uh, will be put into the new messenger RNA. Remember, of course, that messenger RNA is the RNA that's used by the ribosomes to translate uh, and to make protein. Well, it turns out that RNA polymerase is a multiple subunit protein, meaning it has multiple polypeptide chains that interact together to provide the function of copying RNA uh, from DNA. DNA polymerase 3, for example, is also a, a, a multi-subunit um, 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 uh, enzyme. I can't get the word there. Okay, now one of the subunits of RNA polymerase that's important is a subunit called sigma. And the function of sigma appears to be to help the RNA polymerase recognize these sequences in the promoter. So the function of sigma one of the subunits of RNA polymerase is to recognize and bind to those sequences in the promoter. So during the process of transcription, what will happen is that the RNA polymerase, which is bound to sigma, will bind to, uh, the sigma will help the, RNA, the rest of the RNA polymerase 
to recognize and bind to these minus 10 and minus 35 sequences in the DNA so that transcription can begin. Now, the process of transcription we break into three steps. The first step being initiation. And the initiation step is fairly simple. First, it involves the binding of the RNA polymerase to the sequences that I just described. I should also note that the uh, prokaryotic transcription is different from eukaryotic transcription in a very significant way. And that is in prokaryotic transcription, RNA polymerase binds directly to the promoter sequence and transcription starts thanks to the sigma subunit. In eukaryotic transcription, I noted that there, were, there was a machinery, and that machinery consists of a whole bunch of other proteins that aren't part of the RNA polymerase that help the polymerase to find where the promoter is and start transcription. So what I'm going to describe to you here is the process that prokaryotes use, and then I'll say a few things about eukaryotes later. So, as I said, the process of transcription is broken into three steps, and that's true uh, for prokaryotes and for eukaryotes. The first step, process, step in the process is called initiation. The second step in the process is elongation, and that's where the RNA polymerase is going along, copying the nucleotides and making them into a larger, longer messenger RNA. And finally, the process of termination, as we can see over here. Well, initiation in prokaryotes is largely the binding of the RNA polymerase uh, to the uh, promoter sequence and the synthesis of the first few nucleotides. There's about 10 nucleotides or so uh, during which the polymerase binds and um, uh, synthesizes the first 10 nucleotides. At about nucleotide number 10, the sigma subunit leaves because it no longer is needed uh, by the polymerase to recognize the promoter. So upon the departure, the leaving of the um, sigma subunit from the RNA polymerase, they, uh, we are at what we call the end of the initiation phase of transcription. Then we move into the elongation phase, and the elongation phase is not particularly noteworthy other than the fact that RNA polymerase is moving along, copying the DNA, and now looking for a place to stop. So the stop part of the process uh, of transcription is the third phase, and that's what we call termination. And it's here I want to say a few words, and the few words relate to termination of transcription in the uh, prokaryotic uh, cells. Prokaryotic cells have two primary means of terminating uh, transcription. One uh, is known as the factor-independent model for uh, termination of transcription, and the other is known as the factor-dependent model for termination of transcription. The independent model is shown on the top. I've talked about it briefly in the class, and I'll say a little bit more about it here. The factor-independent model gets its name from the fact that no protein factor is necessary for termination of these transcripts. So I should note that some genes will terminate by factor-independent methods, other genes will have their transcription terminated by factor-dependent methods. Well, in the factor-independent methods, the uh, gene has a sequence that's built into it that is self-complementary. That self-complementary sequence can form a stem loop structure like you can see here um, in, uh, on the back side of the RNA polymerase that makes what is either called a hairpin or a stem loop. They're called by either term. And that's a base paired region within the RNA that has just been made. You can see the RNA is just emerging from the RNA polymerase, uh, as you can see here. Well, it turns out that the formation of that structure is actually a signal to the RNA polymerase to stop. I describe it in class as if that uh, hairpin is actually lifting up the RNA polymerase off of the DNA and f uh, facilitating the, uh, uh, the falling apart of everything so that transcription termination occurs immediately upon the formation of that stem loop. Well, that stem loop is only going to form after the RNA polymerase has made it, so it's a fairly specific place to stop the transcription process. Notice that no other proteins were necessary in order for this termination to occur.
The other method for terminating transcription in prokaryotes, and again, I'm only talking in prokaryotes, relates to what's called the factor-dependent method. And as its name suggests, this method requires a cell to use a protein factor to accomplish transcriptional termination. The protein factor is shown here on the back side. It's a sort of a greenish blob that we call Rho, R-H-O. And so Rho is a protein that's floating around in a uh, prokaryotic cell. And that Rho protein is, um, has an unusual property. It looks for the five prime end of a messenger RNA that's being made. So for example, the five prime end of this particular messenger RNA way out here emerged from the polymerase as the very first part of the messenger RNA being made. And it laid out away from the DNA. Well, after it was out there for a period of time, Rho protein recognized that five prime end, grabbed a hold of it, and then it started what a very interesting process. It started literally climbing up that messenger RNA. Well, if you think about it, what's happening is the RNA polymerase at the front end is making new RNA. It's moving uh, on the screen from your left to your right. It's moving out here making new RNA, which means that new RNA is emerging from the backside of this polymerase, okay? More emerging from the backside of this polymerase. Meanwhile, Rho is climbing that rope, trying to catch up with the polymerase. Well, if the Rho climbs at the same rate that the polymerase moves, then nothing is going to happen. On the other hand, if Rho moves faster than the RNA polymerase moves, Rho will eventually catch the RNA polymerase. Well, that's actually what happens in the cell. Rho starts climbing and climbing, and the RNA polymerase moves with varying speed through the DNA. In some places, the RNA polymerase moves relatively fast, and fast for an RNA polymerase is about 50 nucleotides per second. That's fast, but not nearly as fast as a DNA polymerase in prokaryotic cells, which goes at about 1,000 nucleotides a second. But in any event, the RNA polymerase is moving along for an RNA polymerase fairly fast at about 50 nucleotides per second, and it slows down on occasion, and it slows down when it hits sequences that are rich in GC. Sequences that are rich in GC slow the RNA polymerase down because it has a harder time taking apart those strands. And so it's commonly in those GC-rich sequences where Rho protein catches the RNA polymerase, and when it catches the RNA polymerase, it literally takes everything apart, transcription stops, and transcription termination, of course, has occurred.